Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to another class. So as we promised, we're going to start to look into science examples starting today. And uh, we got a great lineup of different applications. Um, they're going to match everybody's um, science proposal. I got an opportunity to read everybody's. And I send back my um, preliminary feedback to everyone. You should already get them last uh, yesterday night or yesterday afternoon. Um, it covered my in assessment of your science case, if this is going to be help you to address that, and feasibility and potential challenges. OK, so you should all got that. Um, Upon examination, I found most of everybody's cases are all looking at the, the structure factor. Okay, so there's broadly can be categorized by three science areas everybody wants to touch. One of them is very, it's a great match with what we're gonna cover today, block of polymer. Uh, that include Kyle's example, and um, Dane's example from ERDC. Um, both of you are looking at block of polymer assembly for impact medication applications. We also have uh, Makila and uh, Mark. Mark haven't been here yet. Both of you are looking at uh, porous carbon based on block of polymer template. So they are also relevant. All of you are cover similar topics, so it, this today's class will be highly relevant to your applications. Okay, and I'm gonna go slowly and explain block upon my assembly just in. in it. We also have people interested in looking at uh, crystalline structure, and generally speaking, this covers either bulk or thin film or a byproduct during the degradation. For the thin film, many of you are interested in. Elect optoelectronics, not too surprising, we have two groups doing a lot of symphony devices. So I will cover that in the next lecture, um, give you a few examples how to do data analysis, um, how people can extract useful information for symphonies during GWAX example. And last but not least, uh, there's a lot of classic example people want to examine is Crystalline structure, how different crystalline structure impact your performance. This covers also quite a bit. Um, there's people interested to look at MOF, although Nathan, I don't think we're gonna have the real sample to look at, right? Uh, we also have, uh, for example, Will and Lena are looking at uh, composites. Um, for example, how does different building blocks impact their crystalline structure? or how does porosity in your material has been, can be characterized. They are slightly different, but uh, we will cover that in, the, in the lecture three. So today, block of polymer. Thursday, uh, same film of devices. Next Tuesday, we're gonna have a special lecture, as I mentioned, right? We're gonna have a professor from Case Western University zoom in to talk about his um, polymer nanocomposites approach and how he uses uh, scattering to understand the nanocomposites. I think that pretty much covers all. So three big area, we should be able to cover all three. And uh, let's see how we can plan in November to squeeze in as much sample as possible during those um, three different slots, okay? So now let's go back to Today's example, example one, is block of polymer. And uh, that's where my PhD thesis are working on. So I'm going to take a little bit uh, advantage of my PhD work and talk a little bit of what we did back then. But it should be quite suitable because um, block of polymer assembly can generally apply to a bunch of different block form. In this case, it's one material, but it's, it's the same science behind it. I'll go through a couple examples and uh, I'll go through a couple in situ annealings. The slides is in the canvas. You, you should be able to get that. As well, I put two representative paper there. Um, you can take a look. I always gonna list those five questions for every science example because it's a good starting point for us to engage the science problem. 
So first is, why do I need to use x-ray for your study? I think everybody should have a very clear picture when you write your proposal. You guys all did a pretty good job articulate how the big picture or the science background you're involved and how x-ray can help you. So I don't worry about topic one. I'm sure everybody has a good understanding. For block of polymer, we need to think about if the feature size of interest is within your study. Um, is the measurement within the range of this particular size, which is ex accessible with the instrument here using the sex wax? Block of polymer has usually periodicity on the order of tens of nanometer up to maybe a hundred in some extreme case. Or bottle brushes set to one or two hundred nanometer, so certainly feasible. This one is a little bit tricky. Is there sufficient scaling contrast? Okay, this is a little bit tricky because contrast matters in collecting efficiency. If your contrast are high, you can finish your experiment at a much shorter time because per volume of your sample, it scatters more strongly. You need less time to accumulate enough signal to get for your data analysis. So I leave that as open question because for polymer, uh, that's not uh, typically strong in a sense that all your material is made of uh, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen in many cases, or nitrogen. So if you calculate scalar lens density, there are not a lot of contrast. Compared to, uh, for example, you have low to nanoparticles in your material, then as we talked about, you can calculate scalar lens density. It's roughly scale proportionally with atomic number, so heavy element scatters much stronger. Your silica nanoparticle, for example, loaded in polymer will be much strong. Um, four and five, is my sample too thick or too thin? That's a good question. We talked about attenuation. You need to ensure um, you get a reasonable transmission to get good results. Last but not least, is it isotropic? Um, it is an interesting question because if your sample are anisotropic, then you need to consider how to mount your sample with respect to x-ray. You need to rotate the sample to get all the information out. But most of the polymer, especially block of polymer, um, they may be anisotropic on the order of hundreds of nanometer or hundred nanom uh, a micron, which is typically the grain size. Within this grain, everything is aligned or oriented in a given direction, but our being is typically millimeter size. So in normal circumstance, you don't expect much um, anisotropic behavior, okay? So you don't need to worry about that unless you do something to orient your, uh, your block of polymer. For example, we heard a seminar talk from Professor Osuji coming from UPenn. He talks about using magnetic field to allow your block of polymer. With that, you can achieve millimeter um, grain size, which is, means your sample starts to be, become quite anisotropic. So, Let's start with a few short introduction of block of polymer. For those who already know, it should be fairly easy. For those who don't know, um, block of polymer are composed of two homopolymer covalently joined at the, at the middle or center of the polymer. Um, they're unique in a sense that in the early days, polymer, as we learned from polymer physics class, um, because of connect monomer are uniquely connected, the entropy for the mixing is very low. So in many cases, your polymer could potentially phase separate. Um, block of polymer is one way to limit its phase separation size. If you just uh, blend two material together, it has high chi value, you're gonna have large macroscopic phase separation on the order of micron size. So it's very hard to, to um, achieve some of the, for example, mechanical property you need. So 
in engineering field, in plastic engineering, people need to use compatibilizer to minimize the phase separation. For block polymer, that's another case. They want phase separate, but they could not be too far away. They're covalently bound by the, um, at the middle of the polymer. They want to minimize the contact because they, the red and blue blocks really don't like each other. They want to minimize the contact area as small as possible. So they ended up to form a blue-rich domain and a red-rich domain. And because you cannot have another one just because they are covalent bonded, so they're alternating in space. And this is done by early 60s, 70s. People already did a lot of work. And uh, Frank Bates uh, and the Professor Leibler from France showed a great example of how they can construct something called phase diagram for block polymer. Um, how do we read this phase diagram? It's plotted as the x-axis is plotted as f as volume fraction. So how much minor blocks are in your system? So zero means it's purely majority polymer. Look at here. A quarter means you have volume fraction about one for the minor block, three, or 75% for the major block. And this is half, half, OK? And you can go so on and so forth. Y-axis, it's plotted chi n. And if everybody still remember, chi is Flory-Huggins parameter, defines as um, strength of segregation or how much energy penalty you want to put two materials together. The larger the chi value, the more unfavorable interaction between two blocks are. N, degree of polymerization. So chi N combined together defines the segregation strength. The bigger the value, the more likely they're going to phase separate. So the phase diagram looks like a um, parabolic shape. So outside this giant parabolic shape, you have something called DIS, or short for disorder states. So which means there is a lower critical boundary when chi and n theoretically is below 0 10.5. Uh, you won't have any ordering happening. So what that means is the penalty for two phases to mix is not that high. The red will be happily dispersed in the blue. Keep it in mind, because chi is usually defined when you choice of your polymer. So let's say you pick polystyrene, polyisoprene, the chi and value is already defined. You don't have much room to change it. N is degree of polymerization, so you can change it. In other words, for the same block of polymer, you could have it go from phase mixed to phase separated. OK, so you, let's say I made a PS polyisoprene has molecular weight about 10 kilodalton. If you calculate chi n, it might be sit here, but now I made uh, both blocks to be longer. I'm going to keep the volume fraction the same, but I can go up in segregation strength. So I could basically go from disorder to order states. OK? So the higher the molecular weight, the stronger the phase separate. Um, the other part that you can play with block of polymer is the relatively block length. You can have one block longer than the other. In that scenario, you can change the F value. OK, now let's think about another scenario. We went up and down in phase diagram from disorder to lamella state. Let's keep chi and n to 60. So, that means when you pick material, that N is defined, that molecular weight is defined. Assume, assumption is, let's have, think about a 100 kilodalton block of polymer. I didn't tell you, let's still use PS polyisoprene as an example. I didn't tell you where, how much isoprene is, how much polystyrene is, but combined molecular weight, let's fix it to be 100 kilodalton. So in one case, let's say um, 
I want to maximize the polystyrene block. I can have 99% polystyrene, 1% polyisoprene. So when it's 99 kilodalton, and the other part is 1 kilodalton. So we go from here. 1% is roughly here. That 1% polyisoprene will be happily dispersed in polystyrene. So you will have a disordered, basically homogeneous film. OK? When I increase the molecular weight, now my polystyrene goes from 99K to, let's say, 80K. And your polyisoprene goes from 1K to 20 kilodalton. You're going to have 40 cent to the cubic phase. And you can have hexahedral phase. And the window for forming hexahedral phase is relatively large. Hexahedral cylinder, OK? So that's what it, this means, cylindrical phase. But they usually packed in. If you look from front, it's lines. But if you look from the side, from this way, you would see hexagonally packed uh, cylinders. Keep going, you would have lamella phase. This is basically now, if you think about 50-50%, so 50 PS, 50 polyisoprene, then they're going to have all the layer of um, different block, as shown here as a lamella. Um, that's pretty nice. So uh, a good example is if you go to shop in the corner market, you buy a cake, you cut from the side, you can see layers of cake. That's a good example of what you see here. And we didn't cover this part. There is a matter There is a stable phase. I should not call it matter space. Gyro is stable, but there's only a tiny window you can for this bicontinuous gyro phase, which means uh, looking looks like that. You have a continuation of minor block. They're going across your bulk, but they're not that well ordered. Um, more recently, there's people found more easy ways to repeatedly manufacture gyroid structure. Such a professor in Taiwan, Ru Ming Ho, is a good person to, to look for. He actually played with a lot of polystyrene, polylactic acid to self-assemble those gyroid structure. And it's actually pretty cool images if you could uh, assemble them and etch away these blue, blo uh, blue blocks, make them void. You can degrade PLA in acid. You leave polystyrene porous matrix. You can backfill with any other nanomaterials and throw away the polystyrene. Thinking about like a die cast, you can remove the die, and then you can left over any gyroid metal structure. He did a lot of those works. Looks very nice, impressive. So why scattering is useful in this case, studying block polymer? It is not only technique can study it, but if we think about this phase separate typically, I haven't talked about size scale. If you look at the top, the distance from a blue block to the center of another blue block is typically on the order of tens of nanometer up to um, hundred, up to a hundred for typical linear block polymer. And the phase separation size is defined by your molecular weight and your segregation strength chi, OK? We have an equation I'm going to talk about maybe later to show you how this is relevant. So x-ray happened. This is reminiscent to, similar to what we learned from crystalline structures for any structure. So you have FCC crystallites. You have other material. What is interesting is those are typically on the order of angstrom level, but block polymer self-assemble into bigger because your domain spans a uh, much longer, much bigger part of the polymer chain. OK? So x-ray is perfect because you can look at the structure factor. You are not looking at the shape of each individual domain. Um, we actually cannot easily do that, but you can tell the self assemble if it's for a spherical cylinder by looking at uh, where the peaks are, especially the higher order peak. I'll chat about that as well. 
So, in other words, it's a great way to use X-ray scattering slash diffraction in this case. It's more relevant to diffraction, I would say, uh, to quantify the phase behavior. Um, a short example, there's a, a great need to extend the Moore's law. This is probably a little bit outdated. That only goes up to 2010 when I was presenting my thesis. Um, as you can see, it still is a lot of interest to extend the Moore's law, although the block polymer is a little bit challenging to keep up. Because um, back 2008, the, the lithography technique, when you buy, back then I think iPhone just came out probably, the first generation in 2008. Back then, you get the computer chips are made on lithography on the order of maybe 20 to 40 nanometer lithography technique. Nowadays, you heard about um, TSMC. Or did I say there? Taiwan manuf semiconductor manufacturer. They now make chips on the consistently on the order of 5 nanometer lithography together with A and D. So they're certainly ahead of the block polymer game. Block polymer um, used to self-assemble on the order of um, seven to up to 100 nanometer or so. So back then, if you can self-assemble 10 nanometer, it was a very impressive technology because lithography has not been able to reach sub-10 nanometer yet. Lots of interest, especially in um, in Intel in. In other area in semiconducting research console, there is a conglomerate in the US or the semiconducting company pay a membership fee code to the semiconducting research console. They, they also develop a roadmaps to what's the next step. Block polymer was back then high on the list. Um, we had researchers from CG, HGST, Ricardo Ruiz, and uh, Paul Neely. Um, back then in University of Wisconsin showing you can actually pattern using lithography on, on any features on the order of 100 nanometers then fill the gap in between using the block polymer assembly. Um, it was very impressive. A lot of people truly think this will be replacing the uh, current technology. But it didn't pan out as planned. And I can tell you a little bit about that. The challenge in full block polymer lithography compared to this commercial lithography is actually relevant to the tolerance of defect. Unfortunately, block polymer self-assembly looks highly ordered. I will show a couple images, but you still have a, you know, one defect out of a million or so, which is pretty good one out of a million in terms of defect density. You can have a block upon a sample not in its ideal position. It's weird structure happening there. But for semiconductors, they actually have much stringent requirement. They could not tolerate even one out of a million. So you, you generate a lot of defects in the drill manufacturer using block polymer. So the yield cannot be high enough to meet industrial standards. So unfortunately, this technique didn't span. There's a couple areas. One I mentioned is lithography. Uh, nanomaterial templates is another interesting area. You can use block polymer to template other materials. In this case, you can, you can use block polymer to make holes on the tensile nanometer and fill other nano metals in it. So, some of the work currently in, in Juris Group, like uh, Michaela and uh, Mark is doing, is relevant to this. So they're using block polymer to make a template. They can template other material. You have uh, block polymer membranes. Is some of the work we still do a, a little bit in our group, using block polymer to self-assemble into membranes and use these nanopores to do filtration. And there is some work done in the photonics. Um, this was actually some of the early works from Bob Grubbs to look at bottle brush polymer self-assembly 
to replace the linear polymer with a bottle brush structure, you can actually self-assemble into fairly large features. To interact with the light, if you think about diffraction or Bragg law, you need features to self-assemble in at least a quarter wavelength of your light. That means you need uh, at least 100 to 200 nanometer domain size to interact with light. So most of linear block polymer is very challenging to self-assemble above 100 nanometer just because you need to increase molecular weight to make them self-assemble into larger and larger domain. But a side effect when you have super big molecular weight is polymer are so entangled with each other, it takes unpractical long time, let's say a few months to self-assemble an order structure or even years. But bottle brush polymer back then was has the ability to self-assemble here. The scale bar is 200 nanometer, you can see. You can self-assemble well-defined layers of alternating polymers to make photonic crystal, okay? That was uh, back in 2012. Um, they should actually show you make high molecule weight bottle brush itself will self-assemble, oh, here is high molecule weight. It will self-assemble into domains up to 200 or 300 ish, and it will interfere with uh, red light. And you could also self assemble into low periodicity, it will interact uh, with low wavelengths, which is in the blue light region. Now you can blend those two to create a rainbow like color because they can co assemble into different domain size. Um, this is a good example there where people see how you can generate large domains. So I want to point first uh, to this part, then we will explain how to read these scattering curves. What are they? Okay. So in this example, my PhD advisor, Tom Russell, was a very, very big name in block polymer assembly. He did some of the early works to show how you can control the orientation of block polymer. To make a lithography, you first need to uh, make lines or dots. Back that time, if you think about lamella, if one face of lamella like to interact with substrate, then your lamella like to make the cake structure like lying down. Layers of layers, just because um, one block says, I want to stick to the bottom because I'm good buddy with the substrate. They have a favorable interaction. Then it forces everything to lie in flat. Same for cylindrical domain. It's easier to make cylinder lying in plane to form lines than standing up, okay? Um, you can think about there is a giant magnet on the floor, then it's gonna stack me, I'm gonna lie down horizontally. Um, she, he did a great way to control the surface energy. So he thought about how can we neutralize the surface energy, then you can make the block pump stand up. So one way, Back in 2000, the time it was to make a neutral surface. So your surface is not, not favorable for block A or for block B, then once you're in the incommensurate thickness range, your block polymer will stand up. So that's some of the reason you can see these block polymers standing up. The other problem is they typically have small grain boundary and I'll show you later. So they self, typically they have very good hexagonal order within a few microns. And outside the microns, like crystalline structure, they're gonna form polycrystal. Your crystallites will for, adopt a different orientation. And in this case, he actually showed you can use a biased substrate, which is a miscut crystal from um, sapphire, which is a metal, oh uh, sorry, an inorganic, ceramic, then you can heat up at high temperature. It will form this crystalline facets, okay? Those facets are periodic, but more importantly is they are oriented in one dimension. So uh, AFN shows here, all the facets are orienting in, in diagonal direction, so this way. And around it, you have ridges and valleys going up and down. But the key part is it's always pointing to the same direction for the ridge part. When you put a block of polymer there, they can self-assemble into 
structures up to millimeter size um, brain uh, grain boundary. So every block of polymer is oriented in one direction because of guided by this substrate, okay? You can do direct self-assembly. And there's a lot of other exciting works ongoing at the same time. Kevin Ross from MIT and uh, Paul Neely from Wisconsin is two notable examples. They do direct assembly using lithography. So they can use e beam lithography to pattern a structure and then put a block upon my eye. So now when Tom and his postdoc put this block upon my in the x-ray, they do scattering. As I mentioned, if your structure is not isotropic, then your scattering will depend on how you oriented it. And that's exactly the case. If you look at uh, this particular scattering, you can think about this hexagonal packed lattice is going up and down. When you shoot x-ray in this direction, what do you see is you have higher order peaks is due to higher um, correlation or good order in your material. You have two first peak, second, third, four, five, six. So pretty good for the typical block polymer. Um, because of low scattering contrast, you typically don't see high order more than second or third peak, okay? That's very common. You don't see third, fourth, fifth, sixth peak. But more importantly, if you look at the value of each peak, they actually pack perfectly in equal distance. If we, we define the first peak as at Q equals to Q star, the second peak will be twice of that value. Third world peak will be exactly three times of original peak, so on and so forth. But if I rotate my sample by 30 degree, now scattering looks totally different as shown in this example, where you have first peak, then you have a root, the second, third, fourth peak. There may be a fifth peak, but relatively weak. However, how do we read this? So this comes from how the crystal lattice is packed. We explained um, in older structure in the lecture, there's a certain rules we can adopt to understand the packing structure. This is a signature of you have lamella-shaped structure. There is no forbidden rule that allow you to see layers of structure. So if you look at this way, you have layers of dots or cylinders. In this case, this is more reminiscent to center, face center the cube. So this is quite useful for identify crystal packing. In a typical block of polymer scattering, you can look at your, where your peaks are. So this table shows you what the structure of your crystal is. You can form lamella, you can form hexagonal pack the cylinders, or you can form cubic, body center the cubic structure, or face center the cubic. So these are different morphology. Ben, please. So kind of bringing this back full circle. This is yeah. like the specifics for structure kind of Yeah. Yeah, so if you f do throw your block polymer, shine x-ray, assuming it's not highly older like this case, you would have multiple peaks showing up. That's expected. From the first peak, you can identify the packing distance, what's every distance between the domain, right? But more, more useful, or also useful, is you can use to identify if you form spherical domain that is body center cubic, or you form cylindrical domains that adopt a, a, a different packing, or you form lamella. How do you do that? Is basically you look at first peak position. You can measure that Q, get a value. You can look at second peak position. And you need to understand what the ratio between high order Qs versus Q star, which is first order peak, or the first peak, it shows up, the most intense one. Lamella always follows one, two, three, four, five, six, as shown in that example. So if you equal distance of peaks, that's indicative of you forming lamella packing. Let's take a look at hexagonal. 
So what this means is um, it will form peak relationship of one as the first peak. Second one will be root three. The third is going to be root four or equals to two. So these basically tell you where the third peaks are. The fourth is going to be root seven. And, and fifth is going to be root nine. As you can see, they show different crystal packing. And they will help you identify what the packing structure you have by looking at where the peaks are. And why there is, um, let's say, in this case, you're missing root three and missing root seven, right? It's basically canceled out by symmetry of your packing structure, OK? So that's how you can adopt this cool techniques to identify packing structure. Block polymer sometimes is not strongly scattered, so you typically don't see more than fifth, fourth order, five and six is really weak. But for inorganic crystals, you can easily identify high order peaks up to seven, eight. Um, so if we go back again, that's what you can see. Let me zoom in a little bit. So as you show here, um, this is a signature of another lattice packing. And this is, because this is isotropic, so that's why rotation happens. But for typical block polymer, you don't need to worry about that, as you are not doing any direct assembly. I'll, I'll quickly go through um, maybe just uh, two examples. What you can do is x-rays as compared to other techniques. So back then, um, block polymer is useful to form order structure, but their assembly pathway is not clear. What that means is um, uh, commonly people do solvent vapor annealing. You put the block polymer sample, spin coat on substrate. You add a solvent reservoir in it. Solvent want to evaporate and going to be absorbed by your film. And this promotes ordering process. So as once you sprinkle the sample from a solution, you can see they form dotted pattern, but it's pretty disordered. What that means you only have short range of order. You maybe find an equal distance to your neighbor, but you typically don't have long range order. This, this is opposite if you do solvent vapor annealing. As you can see, the order as showing the bottom as anneal the film was much better. So people start to adopt solvent vapor annealing um, for a couple of reasons. Before that, thermal annealing is most commonly used. You throw a sample in the oven, uh, anneal it up to its above its glass transition temperature for a certain amount of time to promote chain mobility, to promote self-assembly. But uh, it was found uh, solvent annealing has much faster ordering rate, let's say, for high molecular weight, you typically need to order, let's say, overnight. Solvent vapor annealing can get the same job done in a couple minutes. And, it, and typically, assembly results can be even better. So it was a lot of interest to understand what happens when you put solvent into your material. There are several approaches you can do that because what we have been doing is ex situ. You anneal it, you open the jar, you measure what happens to your film. And uh, what we found is morphology actually changes when it's on the vapor environment and once the vapor is gone. I'll show more data on that. More equally important is there's not a lot where you can track what happens in real time. X-ray offers a window we can look at what happens in the ordering process. So, we designed, and schematic was uh, not as fancy as nowadays. People have played a lot with 3D software. This was done in PowerPoint, but it's get the point. We flow the nitrogen gas in a solvent reservoir. So here, you can load any solvent in there. Uh, it will bubbles and carries out saturated vapor uh, here. And there is a second valve. You can mix the solvent vapor with the nitrogen, so you can control the partial vapor pressure into this chamber. The chamber looks like this. You can see 
two orangish windows. Those are made of capitone. And they allow x-ray to pass, but not the vapor. So you can run x-ray scattering coming from this way. So x-ray can come in. There is where to load the sample. X-ray comes in, bounces off, and goes into the back. Uh, the chamber on top also has a quartz window, uh, allow the light to come in and out, so you can measure the film thickness using the interferometer in real time. I think uh, upon I arrived here, we constructed a copy of that. So we do have the solvent annealing chamber here at Southern Miss as well. This is another angle. When you open the lids, um, you can see this is a chamber about on the order of maybe four inches in diameter and about two, three inches in deep. So you've got a closed environment. You can load the liquid vapor in there. So a quick review, what is grazing incident small x-ray scattering? This is an example where x-ray comes in. If you have older domains, your x-ray would bounce off these older structure and give you uh, two-dimensional features. And we can plot Q Y and QX in this case. This is the direct beam, and this is a reflective beam, okay? Direct beam sometimes strong. When it's hit the edge, it can pass it partially the wafer. Um, but you should not focus anything below here, because this is where the horizon of the wafer is. Reflective beam, we typically put a large vertical beam stop to block most of the intense transmission and reflective beam. They're gonna, they are so strong, they're going to destroy your detector, so you need to block it. This is made of the metal rods. It just sits here to block the direct beam. Um, high, first order peak and high order peak, if you look at their relationship, is perfectly 1Q and 2Q. So this is roughly uh, uh, either the ordered cylinder sitting in play or vertical sits lamella. They're both possible. We can now look at the scattering pattern and track this particular peaks. Uh, let's call it the first order peak and understand what's the ordering process. We can track where the peaks are and how sharp this peak is or forward the half max to understand the ordering process. You can do fitting using software to fit out using a very simple equation, so we can define, because there's still air scattering, so we need to take away the background. So this is where the background function, a constant, y, and basically uh, x inverse function, so it's, it's a decay function. And you can fit how many peaks, whatever you like, using this Gaussian shape peak. You can die quite easily using the, um, either the ego or origin. So we can get two useful information. First is scattering vector x where the domains are. This is defined by Bragg condition. Once you get a sharp peak, you know what's the average distance from one domain to the other. The other one is uh, using the shear equation analyst to look at the grain size or fit, or by looking at the forwards half max, which is given uh, by this fitting function w, using this w and using the wavelengths of the x-ray and scattering angle you can see how well ordered your grains are. I'll, I'll go through one example within the next 10, 15 minutes. So this is the way we did all for polystyrene, polytuvirin pyridine. It's about 30 kilo, 34 kilo Dalton combined molecular weight. Polystyrene is the majority, has 70% of volume, and uh, PVP is minor blocks has about 10% of, 30% uh, of volume. We use the THF to swell it, and we can monitor how fast it's being swollen by looking at thickness profile. So when we begin swelling, the film is about 80 nanometer. Then when you start to pump toluene vapors into the chamber, your film gonna absorb it, just because if you look at throughability bit parameter, THF actually a reasonable good solvent because they are very close in solubility parameter for both PS and P2VP. So your sickness will increase over time until it's been almost saturated. 
Now this is a good way you can track how much amount of solvent in the sample so you can rationalize how much solvent impacted your assembly kinetics and pathway. Um, this may be a little bit harder to see down there, but before we anneal them, they face separate but pretty poorly ordered. You might see a little bit of lines here and there, but pretty short range of order. But after we down that annealing profile for about 70 minutes, you start to see quite obviously those cylinder or potentially vertical set of lamellas either are possible. But in this case, it's actually syringical domain defined as by 30% volume fraction of the minor block PVP, okay? So these are cylinders lying and going through this fingerprint pattern. Um, okay, cannot play media, that's fine. <laughs> but you can track how they peak, where they are, by plot this sort of a time-dependent scattering profile. Again, this is a scattering vector. You have intensity, then you can watch what's ordering happens at initial when you deposit the film, as defined by this curve. And how does the ordering happens over time? when you give it more and more solvents. Uh, quite obviously, as you can see, first you see uh, obviously shifting the peak position. Where the peak as deposit film is here, after a year it's shift to lower value. That means your, order, your domain spacing has grown. As remember, two pi divided by peak position gives you feature size. And this is on the order probably you can get 2 pi divided by 2.8, maybe about 20, 122 nanometer. After annealing, it shift to 2.2. That's probably, you can do a more accurate calculation, but 2 pi divided by 2.2 is roughly uh, maybe 25, 26 nanometer, okay? So you grow to three nanometer space. More importantly, the width of the peak at, four, uh, at half maximum also shrinks quite a bit. Uh, let's see, the last data is here. It's much narrow compared to where we start off. And we know why, because uh, the AFN image already told us that the ordering is much better after we anneal it, so your peak sharpness should increase. Combining with the thickness data, we can plot two, three parameters at the same annealing time plot, so we can put domain spacing as measured by 2 pi divided by peak, as defined by this uh, domain spacing is the red dots here, and we can see, as I convert now into real space, this is initially 23 nanometer, and it goes to 25, 26. As annealing time goes on, it goes through that very interesting shape. We also plot the film thickness is uh, this solid black line, as I already showed you. We go from about 85 nanometer to 130 nanometer doing annealing. Yunfei, you have a question? Uh, yeah, for the last slide, as I said, this 2D pattern, uh, 2D scattering pattern, how can you get, get your 1D data? Because I uh -huh, uh -huh. how do you define your Q? That's a good question. So in grading instant geometry, we are not necessarily looking at a ring. So this vertical rod means you have order structure within the um, within in-plane direction, okay? So what we do, as this red box shows, we convert this cross-section into this 1D data. So we do a line cut at the green width and convert this then plot the Q. Let me see. I th I'm sure I should have an image to convert the Q. No. So this basically the Q, and this is the intensity. So we plot intensity versus Q in this cross section. Okay. So as you can see here, here is this quite some strong intensity as shown in this this background. As we walk around this line, your intensity drops until you hit some intense spots again, so this defines as this broad peak. Hey, Reese, please. I have a question that with the two or the going to the one new data as well. How fast is this in terms of how fast can you 
Very good question. So um, I'll, I'll tell you what we did back then and what evolved for the technology for the past 10 years. So in our x-ray here, as we explained, x-ray, CO x-ray tube is, has a much smaller flux. So if you want to do it here, it takes 10 minutes per data spots. So in order to get the good resolution. Um, 20 year, 10, 15 years ago, the synchrotron is already much, much better than what we have. Our X-ray source compared to synchrotron, probably we're on the order of the beamline beauty in the 60s, okay? <laughs> we turn back 60 years if we can teleport. Our X-ray is as good as the synchrotron beamline. Um, probably there is still better just because um, they still have fire flux and beam spots. So in the synchrotron back then, your flux is no longer a problem. You can actually get the data within a few seconds. By that time, we don't need to collect that, in, that much data just because I think here we did every 30 seconds or minutes or so. Um, there's two considerations. First is you don't want it. If you want to capture faster process, you can do that. But back then, we used the older detector. There's a readout time defined by how long it takes to flush the data, take it out. It takes actually a, f a couple seconds. Nowadays, it takes a few milliseconds. Even the detector we have is newer generation, so it's really quick. Detector is no longer the limit, but the flux is the limit. So nowadays, you do the same. You can collect as much as uh, milliseconds. You can do that. But the question is, um, is your kinetics happen at the milliseconds? Not in this case, so you don't need to collect that fast. Um, if your, your whole annealing finishes within one second, then I would consider doing every millisecond take a data point, then watch what happens within that millisecond. This is a process that happens in a few minutes, so back then it's perfect matching kinetics. So, Convert 2D to 1D, that's what you get. You can look at peak shape, et cetera, et cetera. So how do we explain what happens in the annealing? We kind of uh, label them in different color and different region. Let's see if I can zoom in. Nice. So in the first couple minutes, that's roughly about eight minutes, what we saw is fingers swollen, but nothing happens in forwards half max almost and uh, uh, for domain spacing. There is a little bit of shift, but not a lot. So why? And our conclusion was the solvent goes into your film. It fills some voids in there. But at the meantime, your film is still glassy. You have PSPVP. The glass transition temperature for polystyrene is up to, what, 100 degrees Celsius. So what solvent does is plasticize it, make it move. So you need to reach a certain amount to make the polymer mobile at the room temperature. So you need more plasticization to allow it to move. And that's what we believe is a signal of onset of stage two. When you swell more, this is about 10, 15%. When it's past 15%, you start to reach stage two. That signal, the onset of the chain mobility, your chain starts to move around and signaled by your, um, your forward half max start to go down, your domain spacing start to go up until it's hit this point. And I'll explain this point in just a second. So in this here, your film have enough mobility. But a lot of time people haven't realized is solvent not only plasticize your film, it has one more side effect. And this side effect is, it screens out effective chi parameter. When the solvent is swallowed by the same component, your chi between PS, in this case, PVP, drops. And when the chi drops, we know your phase separation strength is gonna drop. So that happens in here. 
When your chain has enough mobility, then you swell it more, you start to lower the chi parameter, that's why the domain spacing start to drop over increased swelling. And this is also indicates you have enough mobility, you start to have a sharpening ordering process right about this range, because four is half max. Look how fast it drops. Then it doesn't change too much over time. Um, I don't think we need to go through the other part of the curve, but I think you guys understand. So this is also some theoretical calculation about what is swell ratio with respect to the TG of the polymer. We know what's a THF TG. We can use the Flory Fox equation to calculate what's swell ratio versus the TG. So assuming this polystyrene, it, when you swell 10% of it, you lower the TG from 100 to roughly 50 degrees Celsius. So you need to reach roughly 20% of swelling to lower the TG of the polymer to room temperature to make it move a mobile. So any swelling below this is not particularly useful for ordering process. Um, this is I already talked about. So your domain spacing L is dependent on segregation strength. So for the original pre-SPVP, you have a certain period of structure, but once you swell with THF, one reason we see reducing periodicity is because the solvent molecular screens out this chi parameter. And this actually is some, with this on theory calculation, you can get effect of chi is dependent on the dry fumes chi multiplied by how much is being swallowed. And domain spacing is dependent on this chi parameter as shown here. Some details, but not relevant to x-ray scattering we're going to cover. OK, so we're just going to cover one quick more point. We only swell to about from 85 nanometer to 120 in that case. What if we keep swelling it? So I want to show this phase diagram. I cut it in half. So we calculate chi n for our material. We actually start from here. Once we swell it, what we lower is chi. We did, we're assuming the solvent swells both block equally. It's reasonable assumption. Probably not exactly equally, but it's reasonable. So we can fix the F value in the swelling. What we change is basically going down. The more solvent we put in, your chi lowers. So we potentially can cross this order disorder states if we put too much solvents in our annealing process. OK, this is the example. Actually, when we swell, the movie didn't play. But if you look at when we swell, this time we have swell much more. We have initial ordering, like we showed before. And the more swell, it will have order. Then it will cross order disorder. Then all of a sudden, in the swollen state, you don't have any peaks anymore. And when we start to take solvent out, we do reverse, and you start to see peak come back again. Uh, let's take a look. One more data point. I think we can wrap up there. In-situ heating is similar to annealing. So this is an example when we do in-situ heating in, in block polymer. You could also do heating to anneal it. So this example shows when we do different time and temperature. So at the beginning, we have room temperature. Then we can put the sample on a hot stage annealed it over different time temperature. So we have a temperature profile as shown in the bottom um, right here. So if we look at this temperature profile, this is the solid line. We can heat the sample up, cross all the disorder transition, stay there, then go back. You could see, interestingly, your domain spacing pretty much follows what you showed before. But more importantly, let's look at forwards half max. The annealing need to reach a certain temperature let order as well as you show. This is a high value of forwards half max. When the order happens, this drops pretty rapidly. And once you heat past disorder states, the peak suddenly got widened. It raises so rapidly to a disorder state.
then it can, when you cool it down, it can go back to older states again. Okay? So as you can see, the one D curve is shown here, Y peaks, ordering happened, this order, and now orders again, once you heat and cool. Then this explains to you what you need to watch out when you do in situ heating or cooling experiment. And um, I jumped a couple slides just for the sake of time. I think the, if you have questions for the other slide, it's also about solvent annealing, but uh, what we did was to look at how fast we remove the solvent, how that impact the morphology. I won't go into too much detail, but I do want to cover this one. This is an example shows more recently from a Kevin Yeager group. Um, they pushed the, uh, the thermal annealing to another level. What they did was using the laser to anneal the sample. They actually apply a laser heating apparatus. So you can think about a laser like a, the scanner you can have in the supermarket, but instead of using a red laser, but they use ion laser can heat the sample. So they can scan the surface. What laser does, as they proposed, is they can quickly anneal the area, then move on to the next area. And the beauty of the laser annealing is it can drive the material into disorder states. And once it's moved away, it will return back to older states. And because of their temperature in, uh, gradient, as defined by this line shape of laser, they can use the temperature gradient to align the block polymer. It's quite impressive, I would say. Look at those highly oriented the block polymer domain. I'll show these SEN images. And this beautiful GWAX data shows very high order peaks for these lamella shaped. As you can see, the Q follows high order Q value. So let's come back to the summary of the question we asked. So for block of polymer, the, uh, the small angle X-ray scattering matches what we need. Wide angle is too narrow a domain size we want to look, right? Sax, so you can look at any features, few nanometer to up to 100. So it's perfect for our tracking of block of polymer. We can do even in situ heating or solvent treatment. You can also subject to laser, it's probably also possible, or other sample chamber you want to apply to your needs. Um, sex also is perfect, as I said, ideal for probing any features for 10 to 100 nanometer. That's why it's quite useful in this scenario. Scattering contrast, um, as you can see, in our example, the contrast is there, but not too high. Typically, you can do two ways to enhance it, either using doping of some metal salts or created nanocavitation, okay? Because when you have nanocavitation, you have contrast with polymer and air is another level. So you can have much shorter measurement time. Is my sample too thick? So in this case, I show you can actually do same thing or both, or, or both feasible as long as it suits your need. For example, you only need to look at domain size and assembly. Um, it's probably easy to just look at the bulk. If you want to look at direct assembly, then you have to do in thin film. Is it isotropic? In most cases, block polymers are, so you don't need to worry about the last point. But unless you're doing something really cool like this, direct assembly, then you can have very large phase separate domains. Um, I think that wraps up uh, this part. I do want to mention the block of polymer assembly is still a big part of people using X ray. So, take ALS example. Their research profile still composed a lot of self assembly work. Not necessarily in a lot of area like we showed today, basically looking at the assembly of block polymer for lithography, but there's a lot of area people are interested. For example, block polymer assembly for polymer electrolytes. Um, that's a big area actually people use block polymer nowadays, replacing um, 
polyvinyl pyridine with polyethylene oxide. PSPEO is a good example of solid electrolytes. And you can make other electrolytes material with a block of polymer. OK? There is also a lot of research people are looking at self-assembled um, electronics. You can make block of polymers and look at self-assemble of electronic structures. Um, there's also people doing biological research. They self-assemble block of polymer to mimic bio biological property, like uh, one of the professors we met a couple of weeks back. Brad Olson from MIT has been doing great works to look at the self-assembly of polypeptides versus um, um, polystyrene diblock of polymer and understand their influence on biological tissues, et cetera. So still a lot of work. And uh, any question for me for using x-ray to study block of polymer? Well, please. Um, is there any way that you could tell if there's any leftover solvent in the polymer when you're using x-ray scattering, or you can't really determine that? Um, possible, possible. Um, it's a little bit trickier to use x-ray just because x solvent scattering lens density and polymer are close. But if you have a way you can introduce a totally different scattering lens density material, that easily can be done. I'll tell you a bit about uh, some great work has been done by Professor Thomas Epps at the University of Delaware. They're using neutrons to exactly doing what you mentioned, to track what the solvents are. They can put deuterate the solvents. So when they put in the solvent in there, now the solvents will scatter differently in this case. And they can also use neutron reflectometer to measure how much solvent in each phase. Um, this can be achieved. OK, any other question? So specifically, let me comment on a few questions that um, some of you have. So for, for polystyrene isoprene, I think that's easy. And you already have been doing a lot of work, Kyle. So I don't see that's any challenges. Either bulk or symphony can be easily done. Right? And uh, probably a good idea to complement with some AFM measurement or SEN to see what a real space image look like in addition to X-ray scattering in your work. I think the same for Dane at Erde. For uh, Makita, for you and for, for Marx, he's still not here. That's ridiculous. Anyway, so to look at uh, um, you know, ordering and structure upon um, carbonization, I think something you need to watch out is ensure you can cross-link the system while you do it. But I do think this is a some experiment you can do by using uh, in situ heating type of experiment. But our setup can only go up to 300 degrees. You can probably look at ordering process from a deposit film all the way to that temperature range. But if you want to go even higher temperature to commonize it, it's going to be a challenge using the tool here. And I bet there are some tools outside in synchrotron that might be able to heat to seven, eight hundred degrees to look at um, real-time carbonization of your material. But I think that's feasible. Okay, with that, let's then let's wrap up today's lecture. So in Thursday we're gonna come back. Then we're gonna talk about semi-crystalline thin film. Um, for devices and how to use GWAX to quantify crystalline structure, okay?